God was tired of ruling the world, so he dropped an immortal orb on Earth to evolve and take his place. The orb lands gracefully on a rock and transforms itself into the shape of the rock. Shortly thereafter, the surrounding area experiences a temperature rise, leading to the formation of moss. The orb transforms into moss. As time passes, the land becomes blanketed in snow, covering the entire area. A wounded wolf emerges in the vicinity and succumbs to its injuries right where the orb is located. The orb assumes the shape of a wolf, complete with the wolf's injury. The orb has the ability to accurately replicate the host's form, capturing all the intricate details. The wound poses no threat to the orb since it heals quickly. The orb quickly learns how to walk. Shortly after, the orb reaches a settlement that appears to be abandoned. A boy, whose name is unknown, emerges from one of the huts. Judging by his reaction, it appears that he is familiar with the deceased wolf. He refers to the wolf as Johan, unaware that his wolf has passed away and the creature before him is an entirely distinct organism. The boy brings the orb into the hut and takes care of it. That night, the orb rests next to the boy on the bed, keeping him warm. The following morning, the boy discloses that he is the sole inhabitant of the settlement. His family has embarked on a journey to the southern regions in search of paradise. It is widely believed that there is an abundance of food and fruits in the southern regions. He chose not to go because he was asked to stay and take care of his grandma and other elderly individuals. All of the other individuals in the settlement have perished, leaving him as the sole survivor. He is patiently waiting for his loved ones to return and accompany him to paradise. Later that day, the boy successfully catches a large fish. He skillfully cuts a portion of the fish to prepare a meal for them to enjoy. He keeps the remaining amount as a reserve. The walls also have dried fish that the boy has been storing as food. Inside the hut, there is a wall adorned with the faces of all the boy's family members. Shortly after that, the boy makes the decision to pursue his family the following morning. He gathers his belongings and embarks on a journey to paradise. He begins his journey south, and the orb continues to accompany him. As he continues his journey southward, he notices a stone serving as a marker. It was discovered that his family members had left the stone as a directional guide for him or anyone else intending to follow the path. As the days pass, the boy eagerly expresses his anticipation to reach paradise and reunite with his family. In the following scene, the ice beneath the boy's feet fractures, causing him to plunge into the water below. He emerges and initially believes that everything is alright until he becomes aware of an injury to his thigh. He pays little attention to it and continues on the journey. However, he quickly begins to experience the impact of the injury as it continues to grow. Afterward, the boy reaches a location that appears to be a decimated settlement. He notices that one of the markers has been marked with an X. This informs him that none of his family members survived beyond that point, they have all passed away. This brings tears to his eyes. Due to the impact of the wound, he is already feeling weak, and he has made the decision to return home. He has carried the orb with him throughout the entire journey. The boy successfully reaches home, although he is already extremely weak. Despite knowing that he has no hope, the boy persists in his efforts to remain strong. After several days, the boy appears exhausted, but he musters the strength to rise from his bed and slowly makes his way to his cherished chair. He takes a seat in front of the photographs of his family. Aware of his impending demise, he implores the orb to remember him. He desires to use the orb for exploration purposes, allowing him to access locations that were previously inaccessible to him. Afterwards, he passes away. The orb transforms into the shape of the boy, assuming his appearance and encompassing all aspects related to him. The orb departs from the hut and embarks on a journey to explore the world, fulfilling the boy's desire. As the orb continues its journey to the south, it remains unaware of the concept of food, leading to repeated instances of malnourishment and eventual demise. However, this is not a problem for him, as he can effortlessly regenerate and return to life. Initially, it took him 12 days to recover, but subsequently, he began to bounce back within a few hours. Shortly after, he arrives at an area filled with dense forests. This indicates that he is leaving the harsh, ice-cold region. Out of nowhere, a colossal bear emerges from behind the individual and once again takes their life. Next, we are transported to a village known as Ninana. March, a young girl, can be observed happily playing with her dolls, which she affectionately refers to as her babies. In addition, she has an older woman whom she considers to be like a big sister. Her name is Perona. March frequently expresses her eagerness to become an adult. She consistently disturbs her parents due to this issue but they remind her that she will mature once she overcomes bedwetting. Shortly after, emissaries from the Yanomi nation arrived in the village. The village has been selected to provide a child for the sacrifice to the Onaguma. 
The purpose of this initiative is to promote peace in the Nenana region. A shaman named Pyorin travels with the envoys and is responsible for choosing one of the village kids to sacrifice. The shaman carefully examines the girls and ultimately selects March to be the sacrificial lamb. People began congratulating March, but she was completely unaware of the reason behind their congratulations. Upon arriving at her family's humble hut, she asks her parents about the reason behind the congratulatory messages she has been receiving. Her parents embrace her tightly, tears streaming down their faces. They inform her that she is the chosen one, which unfortunately implies that she will meet her demise. This news surprises March, and she expresses her regret at not being ready to face death at this time. She feels disappointed that she hasn't had the opportunity to experience adulthood, which was something she had eagerly anticipated. The envoys enter the room, and Hayes, the leader, instructs the parents to step away from March. They are not interested in anything that could compromise the girl's innocence. Hayes is responsible for overseeing March until the time comes for her to be sacrificed. The villagers begin to bring gifts for March, happy to not be the ones being sacrificed. Lala, March's friend, also brings her a beautiful hairpin. Hayes is always around in March, and she never even gives her the space to bathe alone. On the day of her departure, March's parents bid her farewell with tears in their eyes. Not long after they start their journey, a lone person attacks the carriage. The attacker has been identified as Perona. March seizes the opportunity to escape and flees into the forest. She is startled and frightened when she accidentally falls into a pond and witnesses someone emerging from the water, seemingly regenerating. The individual being referred to as the Orb. The guards who were chasing March witnessed this and fled in fear. The orb departs from the pond, and March follows it. March attempts to engage in conversation with the orb, unaware that it lacks the ability to communicate. At the moment, he resembles a dog in human form. However, March deduces that the orb is innocent based on the recent stunt it performed. They quickly reach a tree adorned with ripe, delicious fruits. The girl skillfully climbs the tree and carefully plucks one of the ripe fruits. She extends her hand, offering the object to the orb but the orb swiftly slaps it away. The orb begins devouring the fruit scattered on the ground. In March, the trees bear more fruit, and the sun quickly devours everything. It is understandable that it has not eaten for a very long time. After satisfying its hunger, March attempts to teach the orb a simple Japanese word, thank you. She holds its mouth and uses it to form the word. March has now literally become the mother of the orb. They discover a suitable location and spend the night there together. That night, March dreams about the consequences of her escape. She envisions Lala being sacrificed as a result of her decision to flee. March wakes up with a guilty expression on her face. The following morning, she rises from her bed and prepares to depart, only to discover that the orb continues to trail behind her. She attempts to remove the orb by offering it various fruits, but the orb persistently remains in her presence. March attempts to inquire about the origin of the orb, but the orb is too engrossed in its meal to register her words. March decides to give the orb a name and settles on Emo. She derived the name from the word immortal. On the other hand, Hayes decides to leave two guards with their carriage and the captured Perona. Perona skillfully reveals a makeshift knife concealed within her shoes. While the two guards are engrossed in their conversation, she skillfully uses a knife to cut off her binds. Out of nowhere, a massive bear emerges from the forest and launches an attack on the guards. The bear kills one of the guards, while the other guard successfully escapes. The bear pursues Perona, but she deftly breaks free of her bonds and flees just in time to avoid harm from the bear. The bear relentlessly pursues Perona, but she successfully evades it by leaping off a cliff. She lands in the same pond where March had found herself. Perona begins her pursuit of March from that location. Meanwhile, Hayes has found March. March doesn't argue, she simply starts following Hayes. Perona is currently in search of March and, coincidentally, encounters Emo along the way. She attempts to ask Emo if he has seen any girls nearby, but he simply continues to walk away without responding. Hayes hands March a mysterious jelly and explains that it is customary for the chosen ones to consume the jelly prior to their sacrifice. Despite the strange taste, she perseveres and manages to finish it. Hayashi then asks March about Emo. March is not familiar with him, so she is unable to provide any assistance in that regard. They were in the midst of their discussion when the other guard, who had managed to escape, arrived. He informs Hayes that they have been attacked. He refers to the bear by the name that they all dread, Onaguma. This is the same being to whom they usually offer sacrifices. After eating the entire jar of jelly, March falls unconscious. Hayes and the other guards escort her to the ritual site, where she is securely bound to a slab. 
The bear arrives on the scene shortly after. At that moment, Perona arrives and quickly rushes towards the location where March is tied up. The guards are eager to intervene, but Hayes assures them that there is no need. She confidently states that Onaguma is capable of handling two meals. Just as Imo arrives at the site, Hayes and the guards lock the gate. Imo approaches the bear, and the bear bites his head. Despite the enormous teeth sinking into him, Imo manages to hold his ground. Hayes and the others are observing the scene from an elevated vantage point. Imo transforms into his wolf form in order to confront the bear. A fierce battle ensues between the duo, but Imo learns from his mistakes every time he attempts to confront the bear. After several minutes of intense struggle and fighting, Imo successfully defeats the bear. When Hayes sees this, he is shocked to learn that someone or something is capable of defeating Onaguma. March awakens after the bear has been defeated, and Perona proceeds to untie her. Hayes returns to the site once more, making it clear that she cannot allow them to leave. Their only option is to accompany her back to Yanomi. The people involved are Perona, March, Pyorin, Imo, and the injured bear. March gives Imo a fruit, and after consuming it, he turns towards March and expresses his gratitude by saying thank you. It appears that Imo has once again acquired new knowledge. Next, we will discover the reasons behind Perona's determined efforts to prevent March's murder. When Perona and her sister were younger, her sister was also sacrificed to the Onigami. Perona is determined to prevent anyone else from experiencing the same tragic fate. Currently, the group is en route to Yanomi. The shaman is seated inside the carriage with March and Perona. She subsequently discloses that she is not an authentic shaman but rather a criminal being manipulated by Yanomi for their own self-serving motives. The Yanomi nation is interested in the wealth of Nana. This is the reason they have chosen to participate in the ritual ceremonies. In return, Ninana typically sends them supplies and other beneficial items. They are reluctant to halt this practice as it allows them to continue receiving everything from Ninana. Perona expresses her strong aversion towards the abhorrent tradition. Shortly thereafter, they reach the Yanomi Nation. Hayes informs them that they have the freedom to choose anything they desire, as the expenses will be covered. In March, a woman notices a man who is writing letters and decides to approach him for assistance in writing a letter to her parents. However, she is unable to do this because she has no idea about the whereabouts of her parents. Perona promises to return once they have determined the specific district where their village is located. However, March accidentally leaves a handprint on one of the papers. According to her, the handprint signifies her well-being, and it will be sent to her parents at a later time. Afterward, they decide to visit a ramen stall. March eats quickly because she is already feeling hungry. During the course of the meal, Imo also learns how to use chopsticks. They begin to feel dizzy before they have even finished their meal. Corona, March, and Imo all fall asleep, which was Hayes's plan from the beginning. Imo awakens to discover that he is confined within a cell. Hayes is informing her superiors that Emo is an exceptional individual and could potentially make a valuable contribution to the nation's military capabilities. In order to demonstrate Emo's strength, Hayes deliberately releases a dangerous criminal into his cell with the intention of testing his ability to defend himself. The criminal has promised to grant him freedom if he is able to do so. The criminal thrusts his spear into Emo. Emo demonstrates the ability to adapt to the situation and effortlessly eliminates the criminal. The most remarkable adaptability and impressive regeneration abilities astound Hayes's superiors. Imo successfully learned a new sentence, it hurts. After conducting their small experiment, Imo is escorted to March's cell room. It turns out that Perona is located in the cell directly above them. Perona instructs March to collect any useful items in the room and hand them over to her using the rope line. In March's discovery, they came across an arrow and various other items. They then proceed to pass the arrow to Perona. Later, Imo begins to dig the floor and connect it to the room where they are keeping the wounded bear. Hayes discovers Imo and March inside the room. Then she decides to assign the responsibility of caring for the bear to March. Perona has already formulated her plan. After escaping, she intends to take a souvenir from the bear and present it to the people in her village. Her goal is to persuade them that the ritual is no longer necessary. While cleaning the bear, March feels pity for it. She does not perceive the bear as a threat. She believes that people misunderstood the bear because of its size, leading them to attack it. After a few moments, the bear finally succumbs, and Imo quickly restores the data in his system. However, Perona has successfully escaped from her cell. She successfully enters the storage room. One of the guards notices her and attempts to stop her, but she effortlessly overpowers him. Perona swiftly heads towards March's cell with the intention of setting her free. 
Perona releases March from her cell. Additionally, she releases Pyorin from her confinement in the cell room. Perona planned to remove a portion of the bear, but March intervened and prevented her from doing so. They will explore alternative methods to persuade the villagers. March, Perona, Imo, and Pyorin use the underground sewage system as an escape route from the prison. They were able to locate a wagon for transportation. Soon, they come to the realization that Hayes and her soldiers are pursuing them. Perona attempts to restrain them by shooting arrows, but they persistently advance towards her. Perona engages one of the guards, who manages to climb onto the wagon. Hayes already has a clear shot while she is doing this. In March, it also came to light that Perona had caught Hayes's attention. Hayes fired the arrow, but March bravely intervened and took the arrow intended for Perona. Immediately after this incident, Imo becomes furious and pursues Hayes and the soldiers. Hayes shoots Imo down, but he quickly transforms into the big bear and begins causing widespread destruction. As Perona takes in her surroundings, she fondly reminisces about the first time she laid eyes on March and the countless happy moments they shared. Perona attempts to care for March, but there is very little that can be done. The arrow has penetrated vital organs, and unfortunately, there is no viable solution available. Perona watches helplessly as March tragically passes away before her eyes, unable to intervene and save her. Meanwhile, Imo continues to wreak havoc, leaving destruction in its wake. Perona cradles March in her arms and leaps out of the wagon as Pyron drives away. Perona locates Imo and kindly urges him to let go of his anger. Perona, feeling overwhelmed, reaches for a broken sword, contemplating using it to end her own life. Imo already contains March's consciousness. With the help of Imo, March successfully prevents Perona from taking her own life. Once the soldiers realize that Perona is vulnerable, they attempt to attack her. However, Imo quickly steps in to shield her from harm. He lifts her up and swiftly rides away from the scene. He continues riding toward Ninana. In the meantime, Hayes is on the ground, looking battered from Imo and her troops' assault. Shortly thereafter, the villagers of March receive news that a colossal bear is making its way towards their village. When they hear this, fear overwhelms them. Shortly after, Perona arrives at the village riding on the back of a bear, much to the astonishment of the villagers. She dismounts the bear and approaches March's parents. She hands them the letter with the handprint that March made earlier. Additionally, she informs them about the significance of the handprint letter. She informs them that it indicates March is doing well. Her parents are overcome with emotion and begin to cry. They begin to feel remorse for not making an effort to protect their daughter. They express their gratitude to Perona for all that she did in March. Reports have come in that Hayes and the Animus are at the border, yet they are still focused on this matter. Perona is aware that they are pursuing Imo, and she advises him to depart as soon as possible. Imo shifts into his wolf form and gracefully ventures into the depths of the forest. Perona and a group of soldiers ascend the watchtower in an attempt to impede the progress of the enemies, providing Imo with additional time to make his escape. Perona skillfully shoots an arrow that pierces Hayes's hand, effectively preventing her from being able to shoot Imo. Hayes gazes at Perona, a mischievous grin playing on her lips. Imo proceeds with his journey through the forest, predominantly assuming the form of a wolf. Whenever he needs to climb a tree and pick fruits, he transforms into March. While exploring the forest, Imo suddenly catches a whiff of a familiar scent. It has been discovered that the familiar person is Pyorin. She is taken aback when she sees March approaching her. She finally realizes that the person standing in front of her is Imo, as he undergoes a transformation into the nameless boy. As he steps into the wagon, he notices a bloodstain on the floorboard. Despite appearing visibly sad, he manages to gather himself and begins to depart. The old woman quickly follows him, as she refuses to stay alone once more. After walking for two days, Pyorin becomes extremely exhausted and hungry, leading her to entertain the thought of consuming Imo. In order to prevent her from making any impulsive decisions, Imo climbs up one of the trees in the vicinity and carefully picks some edible fruits for her. She eats until she is full. Later, Pyorin begins to teach Imo how to read and write. She writes words on the ground and asks Imo to give them a try as well. She quickly teaches him how to write his own name. Pyorin expresses her willingness to provide excellent instruction to Imo on the condition that he takes good care of her. Pyorin starts teaching Imo fundamental concepts such as fire, rivers, fish, and more. He can now say good night as well. Next, they arrive at a town that is home to a port. Imo has significantly improved his communication skills. He is now able to communicate effectively. Imo recounts to Pyorin the story of how she first encountered the boy and was transformed by him. They quickly reach their destination and disembark from the boat. Pyorin reveals that she plans to visit her lover's house the following day. 
However, they will have to spend the night in the forest. That night, an unidentified entity or organism emerges from the ground and launches an attack on Emo. The boy's shape is stolen by an unknown force, leaving Emo to confront and fight against it. A person dressed in black clothing emerges next to Emo, indicating that they are likely the individual responsible for creating the orb. He provides words of encouragement to Emo. Emo is informed that the organism's core is located in the middle of its chest, and all he needs to do is remove it and destroy it. In his wolf form, Emo pursues the organism, but it manages to steal it once more. Emo transforms into a massive bear in order to confront the organism. He successfully tears open the chest just before the bear is defeated once more. In March, Emo undergoes a transformation and launches an attack on the organism. He successfully removes the core of the entity and ultimately defeats it. He sits down to catch his breath. The man dressed in black discloses that he is the creator of Emo. The preservation of this world is a crucial objective, which is why he was sent here. A different group of people sent an entity to attack Emo in order to prevent him from performing his duties. After informing him that they will meet again soon, the man in black departs. The next day, Pyorin and Emo reach a house. Pyorin appears quite pleased, as they have successfully overcome all the challenges they faced, with Emo taking on the majority of the tasks. Next, we meet two characters, Gugu, a boy, and his brother, Shin. They reside together in a tent located on the outskirts of the forest. The duo shares a common dream of living in a spacious mansion together. They have come to the realization that the key to achieving this dream is putting in more effort and working harder. The boys work for a specific farmer. They work on the farm and sell the farm produce at the market. Gugu has always noticed a beautiful girl who frequents the market. He is aware that the girl is from the mansion, so he hasn't made any attempt to approach her. One day, while he is at the market, an old man known as the brewer approaches to purchase some items. After leaving, Gugu discovers that the brewer is an eccentric elderly man who resides at the top of the hill. There are also rumors circulating about his potential involvement in illegal activities. That evening, Gugu returns to their tent and discovers a group of boys engaged in conversation with his brother. The boys promptly depart as soon as Gugu arrives. Gugu asks his brother about the identity of the boys, but his brother dismisses him with a shrug. Gugu examines the savings box and discovers that a portion of the money is missing. He asks his brother about it, but once again, his brother shrugs him off. Gugu considers it a robbery and decides to relocate the box to prevent similar incidents from happening again. The next day, Gugu encounters a stray dog and decides to take it under their care. The name of the dog is Mir. Shortly thereafter, Gugu hears the dog's owner calling out to it. As he looks up, he suddenly realizes that the girl he has a crush on is the owner of the dog. He returns the dog to the girl, and as a token of appreciation, she gives Gugu a highly valuable ring. She assures Gugu that he will no longer have to sell vegetables if he manages to sell the ring. Gugu is filled with happiness, but upon arriving home that day, he encounters something that completely dampens his mood. Upon arriving at the tent, he discovers that his brother has absconded with their money. He left a letter stating that he had gone to work in order to earn more money. Gugu is aware that this statement is false, which causes him great emotional distress. Gugu begins to experience malfunctions, which also lead to feelings of depression. As he observes a cart carrying logs of wood, he finds himself contemplating suicide. As he changes his mind, a single log falls off the cart just as it passes by him. Gugu narrowly escapes death as the log flies over his head. The log rolls down a sloping path, causing the cart driver to leave in search of assistance. Gugu becomes aware that the log is on the verge of rolling down the hill, and he notices that his crush is standing at a distance. He begins running to alert his crush about the imminent danger. He successfully pushes the girl out of harm's way, but unfortunately, he ends up falling on the opposite side of the pond. To compound his misfortune, the log inadvertently lands on his face. Gugu considers himself already deceased as he lies down on the other side, patiently awaiting his passing. He discovers that the girl's name is Rin. Luckily, the old brewer happens to be nearby and comes to Gugu's rescue. He brings Gugu back to his home and performs a significant surgery on him. Gugu awakens to the shocking discovery that his face has been disfigured. The old man informs Gugu that he is fortunate to still be alive. He then gives Gugu a mask to wear on his head in order to conceal his unattractive appearance. Three months had passed when Pyorin and Imo finally arrived at the house. Pyorin informs the old man and Gugu about Imo's abilities. The old man explains that Imo is essentially a weapon, and he comprehends why nations would desire to possess him if they were to discover his existence. Gugu and Imo quickly form a strong bond. 
Gugu helps Emo take his first ever bath, as he will be staying with them. It is important for Emo to learn some basic household routines. He informs Emo that he must wake up, clean, cook, and work in the field. One night, Pyorin and the old man engaged in a discussion about the potential financial gain they could achieve by selling Emo. Gugu expresses their disagreement and raises their voice towards the two individuals. Relax, my friend. They were only making a joke, Gugu says. He views Emo as his younger brother and is prepared to defend him. Next, Gugu and Emo are engaged in a discussion when Rin enters the scene. Gugu becomes visibly shaken upon seeing her. Rin is expressing her desire for medication that can effectively eliminate her scar. It appears that she sustained an injury three months ago, and the resulting scar is still visible. It appears to have been the same day that Gugu rescued her. She is still unaware that Gugu saved her that day. As the discussion continues, Rin's interest begins to shift from Gugu to Emo. Gugu is experiencing deep sadness because Rin will never view him as an ordinary individual. Later, the old man advises him to gather his belongings and accept life as it is. In the following scene, Rin politely asks the old man if she can stay with them. The old man agrees, and she promises to return the next day with her belongings. Later, Emo demonstrates his capabilities to Gugu. He has the ability to recreate foods and fruits that he has previously consumed. Additionally, he possesses the ability to create weapons that have previously been employed against him in acts of aggression. During this small experiment, Gugu unintentionally says something that hurts Emo without realizing it. That night, Emo transforms into his wolf form and seeks out a secluded place to rest. The following day, Rian arrives and inquires about Emo's whereabouts. However, Gugu is unaware of Emo's location. However, he is confident that Emo will arrive shortly because they are currently preparing his favorite dish. Gugu visits the old man in his chambers to deliver a remedy that can help Rin get rid of his scar. The old man proceeds to retrieve a hose and forcefully directs it towards Gugu's face. He extracts some alcohol from there. Gugu is in a state of shock and demands an explanation for how this could be possible. During the surgery, the old man discloses that he implanted an additional organ inside Gugu that has the ability to produce alcohol. He did this solely for the purpose of humor and to test its feasibility. Gugu is feeling heartbroken and decides to run away from the house. After Gugu's departure, Emo arrives. Rin informs him about the events and proposes pursuing Gugu, but Emo declines. Pyorin expresses his dissatisfaction with the fact that Gugu is the one responsible for doing the household chores. Confidently, Emo declares that he will cook and proceeds to attend to other household tasks. He enters the kitchen to prepare a dish. After the meal is ready, Pyorin, Rin, and the old man complain that the food he cooked is of poor quality. Gugu's cooking is the best, Pyorin exclaimed. Gugu returns to the tent where he had been staying previously. The following morning, a sense of fear permeates the town as he walks among the people. Everyone perceives Gugu as a monster. He tracks down his former boss and humbly asks to work for him once more. The master is very kind and has accepted Gugu once again. That evening, Chan, the master's son, expresses his dissatisfaction with Gugu's appearance and expresses his desire for him not to reside with them. Gugu's master attempts to reprimand his son, but Gugu reassures them that everything is fine. He calmly states that he will simply return to the tent and resume his work the following day. The master is a much better person in comparison to his son. As he made his way towards the tent, a group of bullies crossed his path and forcefully removed his mask. Gugu makes the decision to no longer wear the mask and allows others to see his true self. He throws the mask into the pond and then departs. As the days pass, Emo attempts to complete all the household chores, but unfortunately, his efforts only result in making things worse. He asks Pyorin to teach him, but she suggests that Emo should find Gugu instead. One night, Chan arrives at Gugu's tent to meet him. He expresses his dissatisfaction whenever he sees Gugu nearby. As a result, Gugu decides to quit his job. He is currently looking for another job, but unfortunately, he is facing difficulty finding employment as no one seems to be willing to hire him. He contemplates selling the ring that Rin gave him, but ultimately decides against it. While walking through the town, Gugu notices someone lying down in an alley. The individual appears to be extremely thin and showing signs of malnourishment. It has been revealed that the boy is Gugu's brother. Feeling sympathy for him, Gugu decides to give him the ring and suggests that he sell it. Perhaps this will assist him in improving his unfortunate circumstances. Afterwards, he departs, hoping that he has managed to instill a glimmer of hope in his seemingly worthless brother. Dejectedly, Gugu returns to his tent that night. He is soon attacked by two individuals who have the intention of selling him. At that moment, Emo arrives and swiftly drives the thugs away. Gugu is filled with joy upon seeing Emo. 
Imo shares that Pyorin has informed him that Gugu is the sole person capable of aiding his personal growth. Imo inquires with Gugu about his plans to return to the old man's house, but Gugu declines. He is still in disbelief that the man consumed such potent wine. Gugu continues to utter these words as he collapses onto the ground, indicating that he has not been consuming food and is currently experiencing the effects of severe starvation. Imo leads him back to the tent. He then uses his power to create a wide variety of food and fruits that he has previously consumed. He gives the food to Gugu, who eats until he is satisfied. The dog named Mira wanders around until it finds the tent. After playing for a few minutes, Mira eventually leaves. Gugu then attempts to comprehend the concept behind Imo's powers. Gugu shares that he and his brother had the opportunity to reside with a prosperous family in the past. Unfortunately, their circumstances took a turn for the worse when the family decided to leave the town. Based on everything Gugu has observed, it can be inferred that Imo possesses the ability to mimic anything or anyone. Due to the emotional pain caused by the death of someone close to him, he has the ability to transform into a human. Yugu sincerely apologizes for causing harm to Imo, and humbly requests that Imo consider assuming his identity upon his passing. By doing this, he will be able to remember him for eternity. This scene is incredibly heartbreaking, as Gugu views Imo as his sole family. Gugu lies down and expresses the need to sleep. Just then, Rin arrives and explains that Mira was the one who led her to the tent. To avoid Rin seeing his face, Gugu quickly covers it. Rin's return home has revealed a heartfelt truth. He is sorely missed by everyone. The people back home are in need of his presence and support. The elderly man has also expressed his apologies for his actions and has made a promise to rid himself of the influence of strong wine. Gugu then reveals that he has discarded his mask, which could potentially pose a problem for him if he needs to return. Rin claims that she is not concerned about his appearance, but Gugu is not yet prepared to believe her. Imo makes the decision to locate Gugu's mask and deliver it to him. After Imo leaves, Rin removes her clothes to reveal a small scar on her hand to Gugu. Are you complaining about this scar that you have? Additionally, she holds the belief that the individual who pushed her harbored animosity towards either her or her father. How could the girl be unaware that the person who pushed her was actually attempting to save her? Even Gugu, the person who saved her, ended up with the most severe scar imaginable. Despite his disfigured face, she complains about a minor scar. Gugu is filled with shock upon seeing the scar, and he is completely unable to believe what he is seeing. Rin expresses a desire to have been born into a family that is not wealthy. This situation exemplifies the concept that what one person finds enjoyable or beneficial, another person may find unpleasant or harmful. Gugu has always harbored a desire to be born into a noble family, whereas Rin holds the exact opposite wish. Rin then asks Gugu about the origin of his scar, but Gugu chooses to remain silent and not disclose any details about it. He believes that once he tells the truth, Rin will come to hate him. Rin then takes out the makeshift mask she had brought for Gugu. She is eager to learn more about Gugu, even if he conceals his face. While retrieving Gugu's mask, Imo's maker unexpectedly appears and advises him to exercise caution. According to him, the enemy is constantly vigilant and actively seeking opportunities. Rin and Gugu later decide to visit the market. Rin's father's henchman arrives to take her away, but Gugu comes to her rescue, and they escape together. Imo soon locates the duo as they sit. He is carrying Gugu's mask with him. Rin decides to use the makeshift mask she brought for Gugu. The trio begins their journey back to the old man's house. While running, they unexpectedly encounter Rin's mistress, who is able to recognize Rin despite wearing a mask. The trio begins to run away, but the mistress pursues them. They are aware that it would be detrimental for them if the woman discovered the location of the house. They instruct Imo to remain behind and devise a plan to evade her pursuit. Imo transforms into March and manages to divert the woman's attention. Suddenly, the malevolent entity reappears and launches a fierce assault on Imo. Gugu hears the noise and quickly rushes back to check on him. He instructs Rin to go to the house and wait for them. When Gugu first arrives on the scene, he quickly realizes that the entity that he and Pyorin had discussed is attacking Imo. The entity has taken on the appearance of a tree and has taken away March's consciousness. The entity simultaneously attacks both Imo and Gugu. Gugu comes up with an idea to defeat the entity by utilizing the strong wine in his system. As the wine spills outside, it ignites and creates a fire. Given that the entity takes the form of a tree, it should be susceptible to fire as a means of defeating it. He pursues the entity, but unfortunately, he has run out of strong wine. Imo forcefully knocks him off the tree he is standing on and sternly instructs him to leave, warning that he will bite him if he doesn't comply. Gugu eagerly begins running towards the old man's house, 
Hoping to energize himself with a potent dose of concentrated wine, he collapses on his way due to the strong wine in his system. He stands up and successfully makes his way home. Gugu is completely shocked when he discovers that Rin's parents are at the house. Gugu first disregards Rin's parents and approaches the old man directly. He insists that the old man fill his glass with the strongest wine available. The old man wants to argue with him, but Pyorin dismisses the idea from his mind. Pyorin suggests complying with whatever he desires. The man has observed a potential rupture in Gugu's system, which requires immediate attention to prevent a fatal outcome. However, the old man proceeds to serve Gugu the strongest wine available. Gugu then addresses Rin's parents, expressing her contentment with her current situation. Gugu, under the influence of wine, confesses his love for Rin before departing. After Rin's departure, his parents express their desire to leave. But Pyorin intervenes and convinces them to stay. She wishes for them to witness the entire spectacle. Gugu arrives at the battle scene and quickly realizes that the entity has fully consumed Imo. The entity launches an attack on him, but he skillfully spills the wine on it and ignites it using the torch he is holding. After defeating the entity, Gugu breaks down in tears as he realizes that there are no traces of Imo left amidst the destruction. At that moment, a white light emerges from the wreckage and comes to rest in the distance. The white light transforms into a solid rock, leading Imo to conclude that he is deceased. The maker of Imo watches attentively as everything unfolds. He is aware that Imo still has some life left in him, so he successfully resurrects him. Imo transforms into his wolf form, and Gugu informs him that he has successfully defeated the monster. Imo expresses his gratitude to him, and the two of them engage in a playful manner. Imo and Gugu arrived at the house only to discover that Rin and her parents were still present. Gugu prepares a delectable dish that receives high praise from everyone for his exceptional culinary skills. Meanwhile, Imo is engaged in a conversation with his creator outside of the house. The creator instructs him to depart from his current location and explore the wider world. The purpose of all this is to help him become stronger. According to his creator, the adversary is known as Knockers, and there is a possibility that he may not be fortunate enough to evade their next assault. In order to protect the people he cares about from the knockers, it is important for him to both enhance his strength and venture outside of the house. When Gugu gets there, he notices Imo talking to himself. It seems that he is unable to see the creator of Imo. Imo informs his creator that he has made the decision to stay with his friends and will not be leaving. Later, Rin decides to leave with her parents and bids farewell to her friends. The story then jumps ahead four years. Goku has developed a strong physique, while Imo has become proficient in performing household tasks. Imo's cooking has also improved significantly. Rin continues to discreetly leave her mansion in order to visit her friends. Next, Rin informs Imo that she is getting ready for her 16th birthday. She is contemplating what to give Gugu, and Imo reassures her that he will appreciate anything she chooses to give him. It has been revealed that Imo has remained unchanged for the past four years due to a lack of reasons to do otherwise. The knockers have also refrained from attacking for the past four years. During her conversation with Imo, Rin discloses that her parents have made arrangements for her to be married on her upcoming birthday. In order to prevent this, she must introduce her boyfriend to her parents before that time. Since they are close, Imo suggests introducing Gugu as her boyfriend. The duo's love for each other persists despite their reluctance to acknowledge it. Gugu's brother arrives later. He discloses that he has spent the last four years searching for Gugu. He takes out the ring that Gugu gave him and reveals that he didn't sell it. He currently supports himself by selling farm tools. He is grateful to Gugu for offering assistance when he was at his lowest point. He desires for Gugu to accompany him in order for them to reunite once more. He still plans to live in a beautifully decorated mansion. Gugu criticizes his brother and expresses that he believes his brother is not prepared to spend time with him any longer. He is unable to leave the people he now considers his family due to financial constraints. Observing that his brother wants no involvement with him, Shin enters the house and presents the old man with the ring. He instructs him to deliver it to Gugu on his behalf. Rin notices the ring and immediately recognizes it. Suddenly, she realizes that Gugu was the young boy who typically sold vegetables at the market. He rescued her dog, and in gratitude, she presented him with the ring as a token of appreciation. She is curious about the type of injury that has led Gugu to wear a mask now. She accepts the ring from the old man and assures him that she will personally deliver it to Gugu. A few moments later, Rin discovers Gugu peacefully lying down and sleeping. 
she attempts to place the ring on his hand, only to find that it doesn't fit. Gugu wakes up, and Rin advises him to take action while he still has the opportunity. She reveals that Gugu once confessed his love for her, but Gugu denies it and claims that he was under the influence of strong wine at the time. After this, Rin runs away. After she leaves, the old man presents Gugu with the new mask he has made for him. The mask is equipped with an igniter and has the ability to dispense strong wine with ease. This is being done in preparation for a future attack. Shortly after, Rin and Imo prepare themselves to go to Rin's birthday party. They went to the market to buy presents for her. Gugu purchases a flower for Rin. This is the same flower that Rin was picking on the day they got injured. The duo arrive at Rin's house shortly after. The mansion is incredibly spacious, and Gugu wastes no time in choosing the foods he desires to eat. He is the center of attention for everyone in the house. Rin arrives, and Gugu presents her with the flower he purchased. This immediately triggers the memory she has been attempting to suppress. Gugu offers an apology, but Rin reassures them that it's alright. She exits the main hall to reflect on that fateful evening. While she is away, a group of boys begin to bully Gugu due to his mask. He accidentally falls into the water fountain. Rin arrives and promptly escorts the boys away while also kindly wiping Gugu's face with a towel. Afterward, Gugu decides to step outside and relax. Rin finds him outside and asks about his injury once more. This time, Gugu makes the decision to tell the truth, and as a result, Rin comes to the realization that Gugu has actually saved her life, something she had never truly appreciated before. The two of them are experiencing a moment filled with emotions as they finally come to accept one another. Suddenly, the ground beneath them splits open, causing Gugu to plummet to the other side. Inside the house, Imo's creator informs him that there is a knocker nearby. According to the creator of Imo, the core of the knocker is located underground. Furthermore, its influence has permeated the entire region, posing a significant threat to the entire area's well-being. Imo instructs everyone in the house to evacuate immediately. He then undergoes a remarkable transformation, turning into a massive bear in an attempt to secure the building until all occupants have safely exited. However, Gugu successfully manages to grab onto something. They lower a clothing rope for him to grasp and ascend to safety. Gugu quickly recognizes that the knockers are the ones causing trouble, prompting him to rush inside the house to assist Imo. He discovers Rin's parents inside the house and successfully rescues them before it collapses. He returns to help Imo. The knocker takes the form of a massive bear, with its body made entirely of stone. Gugu attempts to burn it using fire, but unfortunately, it does not seem to be effective. Gugu then realizes that the inside of the bear will be soft. They just need to find a way to access its insides and burn it out. Imo and Gugu collaborate closely to climb on top of the bear in order to locate an opening. He changes into March to get an advantage over the knocker. In order to enlarge the opening, Imo creates several spears, providing Gugu with the opportunity to pour fire into it. The body detaches to reveal the core. Imo attempts to capture the core, but it manages to escape just before Imo can eliminate it. Gugu and Imo were still in the midst of their celebration for their recent victory when the knocker suddenly launched another attack, resulting in Imo being crushed. The knocker has the ability to absorb March's consciousness. The knocker is about to eliminate Gugu, but Rin arrives just in time to push him out of harm's way. However, the situation takes a turn for the worse when the building collapses on the two individuals. Imo begins to experience a certain type of pain, but he is aware that the pain is somewhat indirect. It was discovered that Gugu had used his own body to shield Rin, preventing the rubble from falling on her. Gugu is experiencing intense pain, and blood is now dripping from his body. This is a poignant moment shared between Gugu and Rin. Gugu promises to go flower picking with her once they escape, but it's clear that only one of them will survive. Rin successfully kisses Gugu through his mask. The duo openly expresses their love for one another, and throughout this time, Imo empathizes with the discomfort that Gugu is experiencing. Shortly after, Imo undergoes a transformation, assuming the form of Gugu. This symbolic change represents the passing of Gugu. Imo is experiencing intense emotional pain due to this situation. The knocker violently assaults him, hurling him into the water. The knocker also jumps into the water, causing the stone around its core to dissolve. The core emerges from its location and quickly jumps into the water in order to escape. Imo's creator informs him that the knocker is currently moving westward, suggesting that it would be wise for Imo to pursue it. He reminds Imo that one of his consciousnesses is stored in the core. However, Imo disregards the main issue and instead focuses on pursuing Gugu. He observes as individuals remove the debris and rescue Rin. Rin is currently unconscious, and Gugu's body has been recovered as well. 
Just then, Gugu's brother arrives to retrieve his brother's body. As this unfolds, Gugu's spirit is observed gradually separating from his friends. He suddenly realizes that he has died, yet his consciousness continues to exist within Imo's body. Shortly afterwards, Imo informs the old man and Pyorin that he will be departing. Once he departs, the knocker will not pursue them any further. After regaining consciousness, Rin quickly rushes to the old man's house in search of Gugu. Imo notices her approaching and promptly assumes the identity of Gugu, as he is unsure of how to break the news to her that her lover has passed away. Rin is filled with joy upon seeing Gugu, and she warmly embraces him. She inquires about Imo, and Gugu sadly informs her that Imo has passed away. He leads her to Gugu's grave, but she mistakenly believes it to be Imo's grave. She sheds tears for Imo and expresses that he was a truly remarkable individual. Rin is surprised when Gugu announces that he is leaving to go shopping. She asks him to meet her at the flower picking site in the evening, and Gugu agrees. The old man and Pyorin generously provide Gugu with both food and money to support him as he embarks on his journey. He takes his leave and bids them farewell. They are experiencing a moment of sadness as they come to terms with the fact that Gugu has passed away and will never return. Later that night, Rin's father locates her where she is resting. She then reveals that she has no intention of getting married because she is already in love with someone. Rin then tearfully reveals her knowledge of Gugu's demise, her eyes welling up with tears as she speaks. However, she is happy that Gugu is now with Imo. Imo has been walking aimlessly for four days now. He reaches out to his creator and poses a series of inquiries. The creator informs him that the knockers will continue their efforts until they have successfully defeated him. Imo's purpose on Earth is to collect information, while the knockers are attempting to hinder this task. Imo is questioning why his creator is unable to fight the knockers on his own. The maker informs him that Imo must be the one to defeat the knockers, not him. It is sad that Gugu has passed away, and Imo expresses that he does not care about anything else. Once again, they find themselves in the midst of a discussion when Imo suddenly catches a familiar scent. He follows the scent and discovers that it leads to Pyorin. Pyorin has been following him ever since he left the old man's house. Pyorin has made the decision to follow Imo and offer her assistance in any way possible. Imo does not want Pyorin to accompany him because he believes she will be at risk. Pyorin asserts that she possesses enough life experience to discern between what is beneficial and detrimental for her. Imo comes to the realization that Pyorin is not yet prepared to give up, and although hesitant, he ultimately agrees. During their journey, Imo chooses to refrain from engaging in conversation with Pyorin, deliberately ignoring her whenever she attempts to initiate a conversation. The pair arrives in a town shortly after, and Pyorin expresses her need to eat. She orders multiple plates of food, which even surprises Imo. Imo attempts to convey to her the urgency of eating quickly so they can depart. It would be catastrophic if the knockers assaulted them while they were still in town. Pyorin remains indifferent and calmly takes a seat to savor her meal. Imo resides on the outskirts of the town. He once again calls upon his maker. He inquires about the location of the knockers, to which the other person responds that they are situated a few kilometers northwest of the town. The creator is capable of sensing the presence of the knockers and determining their location. Imo's apparent conversation with himself surprises Pyorin, who arrives just as he is finishing. Imo proceeds to inform Pyorin about his creator and the existence of the knockers. The next day, Pyorin spots some delectable fruit and becomes eager to try it. Imo attempts to climb the tree, but he repeatedly falls off. Pyorin advises him to switch to March and ascend the tree, as March possesses exceptional tree climbing skills. It appears that Imo is not familiar with who March is. It has been discovered that the knockers not only take away a piece of Imo, but they also steal the memories connected to that individual. Imo decides to become even stronger because he doesn't want to lose the memories of his friends. Later that evening, Pyorin inquires about Imo's strategy for defeating the previous knocker he encountered. Imo explains that Gugu blew fire on it, causing its body to crack open when it jumped into the water. Pyorin explains that when heated, stone becomes brittle upon cooling. Pyorin reveals that she knows of a place where Imo can enhance her strength. There is a ship that travels to Sarlmine, which is an animal paradise that remains largely unvisited. There will be no obstacles that would hinder Imo's training at this location. The next morning, the pair arrived at the port. A girl instructs the duo to enter the ship that is in front of them, and they agree to do so. Upon entering, Pyorin and Imo are immediately separated. Imo was suddenly thrown into a cell. The officer in charge informs the prisoners that they will travel to Jananda Island, where their final phase of life will begin. After the ship docks, Imo successfully sneaks off and uses his wolf form to track Pyorin's location. 
Pyorin is currently being held in a high-security prison located at a significant elevation above ground level. Imo is making an effort to reach his goal, but it appears to be an insurmountable challenge for him. The girl who had enticed Imo and Pyorin onto the ship witnessed Imo's fall from the top of the maximum security prison building. The girl informs Imo that violent criminals are incarcerated in prison with no possibility of escape. The entire island appears to function as a prison. Imo becomes angry with the girl because she intentionally leads them onto the ship, fully aware of their destination. The girl offers her apologies and suggests a way to make amends with him. There is a designated area where Imo can engage in combat, and the victor will be rewarded generously. If Imo emerges victorious in the arena, he will be crowned king of the island and will have the power to decide whether or not to release Pyorin from prison. Imo is taken to the arena where he encounters other contestants. Imo lacks a clear understanding of their role and responsibilities within the arena. The host explains that the competition is divided into stages. Participants will be grouped together, and only the last survivors from each group will advance to the next stage. Imo's group is suddenly released into the arena, and to his surprise, they immediately begin ruthlessly attacking one another, behaving like wild animals. Imo remains at a distance and simply observes, unsure of what action to take. Just moments later, as the tension builds, a contestant is left standing on the verge of being declared the winner. However, just before the announcement, he receives the surprising news that Imo is still alive. He hurls his axe at Imo's head, but it fails to have any effect on him. He futilely pushes several swords into Imo, as he often does. Imo chooses not to attack the man as he is attempting to conceal his powers. After exhausting all his efforts, the contestant finally falls and accepts defeat. Imo has been declared the winner of the match. Imo's amazing abilities have left everyone pleasantly surprised. After the match, a ship girl named Tanari approaches Imo and introduces herself. She also introduces her pet owl whom she affectionately calls Legard. Imo is introduced to all of Tanari's friends, who quickly start referring to him as the Immortal Boy. Additionally, they highlight that he is the frontrunner in the tournament and is expected to become the next chief. Tanari's partners introduce themselves. The first person is Yuroi, a well-built boy. The second person is Mia, a red-headed girl. Shortly afterward, Imo observes that the prisoners lead a seemingly normal life on the island. He is astounded by Tanari's deception in bringing them to the island. He is perplexed about the reason why Pyorin is the sole inmate confined in the maximum security prison, given that all the other individuals on the island are also prisoners. Tanari explains that Pyorin is reputed to be a dangerous criminal. According to reports, she allegedly poisoned Ten Yanomi a significant time ago. Tanari is surprised to learn that Pyorin holds significance for Imo, despite his lack of knowledge about her. Tanari acknowledges that an unidentified person persuaded her to trick Imo and Pyorin into boarding the ship. However, she has no knowledge of the identity of this person. Upon hearing this, Imo becomes angry and decides to leave. He no longer wants any involvement with Tanari and her group. Later that night, Imo expresses his hesitation to his creator about taking the lives of others in the arena. The creator informs Imo that all the participants in the tournament have already made the decision to sacrifice their lives. Therefore, it can be argued that it would not be morally wrong for Imo to kill any of them, as they are already prepared for such an outcome. Imo is peacefully sleeping when an unfamiliar person, dressed in a hoodie, approaches his location. The individual touches their head and playfully licks Imo's cheek with their tongue. The next morning, Tanari receives information that one of their guests has begun participating in the arena matches. Furthermore, it has come to light that their guest is none other than the individual who engaged in the unsettling behavior with Imo last night. On the other hand, Imo is seen attempting to find a way to reach Pyorin. While engaged in this activity, he unexpectedly encounters a blind mole rat and unintentionally causes the rat's demise. After assuming the form of a rat, he discovers his newfound ability to easily navigate through tight spaces. A few moments pass, and Imo confidently steps into the arena for his upcoming match. Imo appears to be hesitant about launching an attack against his opponent, but the man is showing no signs of holding back. Imo transforms into a wolf in an attempt to frighten him but unfortunately, it proves to be ineffective. He transforms into Gugu and emits fire all around him, yet he remains unaffected. Imo is unable to transform into a bear because the knockers currently possess that ability. Suddenly, a memory of Perona floods his mind, causing him to undergo a transformation and assume her appearance. There is only one possible interpretation of this situation. Perona has passed away. 
Utilizing his newfound skill, he adeptly evades his opponent's assault and delivers a forceful strike, incapacitating him without causing fatal harm. After the match, Imo is seen having a solitary moment by the lake. Tanari approaches Imo and offers another sincere apology for her actions. Imo is not ready to listen to her and simply ignores her. Tanari extends an invitation to Imo for the feast she and her friends are hosting. However, Imo remains uninterested. Tanari promises to assist Imo in finding a solution to secure Pyoran's release from her current imprisonment as a means of making amends for her mistake. Imo appears happy upon hearing this and willingly agrees to become Tanari's friend. Later, Imo visits the prison floor to have a conversation with Pyoran. Pyoran is shocked to discover that Perona has also passed away. According to her, Perona must have died with honor while defending those dear to her. Imo promises to find a solution to secure Pyoran's release from prison, as he is unable to leave the island without her. Pyoran has become like family to Imo, and he is not prepared to lose this important bond. The next day, Imo enters the arena to resume his fight. Imo successfully kicks his opponent, Nando, causing him to fall to the floor. Imo then urges Nando to surrender, as he has no intention of killing him. The spectators are continuously shouting at Imo, urging him to defeat his opponent. They shot arrows at his opponent, but he skillfully intercepted them and sliced each arrow in half. Imo's opponent is also surprised by the fact that he is being protected. Out of nowhere, an arrow is shot from behind, striking Imo's opponent in the back. Imo is feeling heartbroken, despite being declared the winner of the match. After the match, Imo feels relieved to discover that Nando is still alive. Nando expresses his gratitude towards Imo for sparing his life and inquires about the reasons behind his decision. Imo expresses that he has personally experienced pain and is familiar with its sensations. As a result, he firmly states that he is not prepared to take another person's life. Nando explains that he arrived on the island due to his brother. Imo promises to help the man and his brother leave the island once he becomes the chief. They were in the midst of their conversation when a group of villagers arrived and began berating Imo. They are complaining that Imo has not killed anyone since the tournament started. Imo attempts to apologize, but the other person is not willing to listen. Abruptly, the earth begins to tremble as the knocker emerges from below. At that moment, Imo was in Gugu's form when the knocker killed him. Imo advises the islanders to quickly flee from the scene in order to prevent any injuries or fatalities. He transforms into his wolf form and leads the knocker to follow him. He transforms into a blind mole rat and discovers an opening in the knocker's body. He begins biting into the core of the knocker, but before any more harm can be done, the knocker successfully throws Imo out. At that moment, the islanders return to assist Imo. An anchor-like device is used to secure the knocker in place. This opportunity allows them to shoot explosive arrows at the knocker. Imo replenishes their arrows whenever they run out. Finally, they were able to create an opening in the knocker's body. Working together, they unleash a barrage of arrows into the opening, ultimately causing the knocker to explode. Imo discovers the core and eliminates it. He manages to reclaim all the personalities that were stolen from him, including March and Gugu. Imo comes to the realization that he is unable to defeat the knocker by himself. He expresses his gratitude to Tanari and her friends for their assistance. Later that night, Imo joins Tanari and her friends for dinner. As they gather around the cozy fireplace, they engage in a thoughtful conversation about their aspirations for the future. Shortly after, Imo utilizes his culinary skills to prepare a variety of delicious dishes for everyone. They begin eating until they reach a point of fullness where they are unable to consume any more food. All of a sudden, everyone who consumed the food lost consciousness. Imo suddenly realizes that he has served one of the meals that Hayes had previously served him, March, and Parona. Hayes secretly added a sedative called Morning Glory to the food. I simply recreated the dish without considering that the meal contained sedatives. He is apologizing for his lack of knowledge. He notices Tanari's diary on the floor and decides to pick it up and read it. Imo is reading the latest chapter, in which Tanari expresses her excitement about Imo joining them for dinner. As he drops the book and begins to walk away, Tanari suddenly wakes up. She apologizes to Imo once again for tricking him into coming to the island. After Imo leaves, Tanari grabs her pen and begins documenting some important facts in her book. Tanari proceeds to share her story with us. She has always had a passion for writing, and pursuing it as a career is her ultimate dream. When she was younger, she lived with her parents. When she was seven years old, she woke up one day and came to the heartbreaking realization that her mother had passed away. Tanari's father has been arrested as a suspect in the case. Tanari's father was scheduled to be sent to the island prompting her to make the decision to accompany him. She firmly believed in her father's innocence and was determined to support him throughout the ordeal. 
After arriving on the island, her father informs her that he has decided to take part in the tournament. He has a plan to win and become the chief of the island. Afterward, he and Tanari can leave the island. Tanari is feeling fearful and has a belief that her father's life is in danger. However, her father provides reassurance by assuring her that he will overcome the situation. He instructs Tanari to meet him at the port after the tournament, where they can both depart together. Shortly after, the tournament begins, and Tanari finds it incredibly difficult to believe that her father is capable of such brutality. She decides to leave the arena because the man she is looking at is no longer recognizable to her. After the tournament concludes, Tanari discovers that her father emerged as the victor. Afterward, she proceeds to the port, where she is supposed to meet her father. Along with the book, her father had left a note for her. In the note, he expressed his desire for her to record her dreams within the pages of the book. Suddenly, Tanari's father appears behind her, only to collapse lifelessly. It appears that people who have a strong dislike for him poisoned him. Tanari walked away, clutching the book in her hand. Ever since that moment, she has diligently documented everything she encounters. She met Yuroi and the rest when she was nine years old. Since then, they have been plotting their escape. She became a member of the import crew when she was 13 years old. When she turned 14, she had the opportunity to meet Amo at the port. This is the moment when the individual wearing a hood successfully persuades Tanari to deceive Pyoran and Imo, leading them onto the ship. The unknown person convinced her that Imo would win the tournament and become a legendary figure. Afterward, he will have the ability to rescue Tanari and her friends from the island. This is the reason why Tanari agrees to lure Imo to the island. In the present day, Imo visits Pyoran and herself. Since he already has marched with him, climbing up to the prison level is a simple task for him. He assures Pyoran that he will rescue her after winning the finals, which are scheduled for the next day. The following day, Imo steps into the arena and discovers that his opponent is none other than the hooded individual. The individual takes off their hood, unveiling their face. It has been revealed that the individual in question is Hayes. She tells Imo that she has been eagerly anticipating a timeline like this. She is also the one who ended Perona. When Imo hears this, he becomes angry. He attempts to pursue Hayes, but she effortlessly evades his attacks. Despite transforming into the big bear, his efforts prove ineffective. No matter what Imo does, Hayes always appears to be one step ahead. Hayes's hurtful words provoke an impulsive reaction from Imo, causing her to confront Hayes without hesitation. She skillfully evades his attack and swiftly administers a sedative needle to his neck. Imo faints, and Hayes is declared the winner of the tournament. After successfully defeating Imo, Hayes delivers a triumphant victory speech. She informs the spectators that she has been closely monitoring Imo for a considerable period of time. She claimed to be the first person to have seen him before he matured. She wants people to join her in caring for Imo. It is evident to everyone that he possesses the ability to accomplish remarkable feats. She desires their participation in forming a formidable defensive army that would deter anyone from daring to attack. Hayes then informs the people that she has no desire to rule. Her only aspiration is to be the overseer of Imo. She willingly gives up her rights to the position of chief of the island, transferring them to Tanari. Upon hearing this, the majority of the crowd becomes enraged and begins devising a plan to harm Tanari. Tanari and her friends swiftly make their way out of the arena, evading any potential attackers. Afterwards, Hayes escorts Imo to the executive quarters located on the island. She gently places him on the bed and proceeds to engage in various activities with him. Imo is experiencing a dreamlike state where he can vividly feel every action that Hayes is performing on him. Shortly after, Tanari and her friends head towards the castle with the intention of rescuing Imo. They entered the room abruptly, only to discover that Imo was not present. Hayes appeared and informed the group that she had already taken Imo to the underground chambers. The captain of the only ship on the island also arrives. Captain Skyfish advises Tanari to surrender in order to avoid being harmed by Hayes. Tanari claims that Imo has the ability to construct a ship of comparable size to Skyfish's vessel. Hayes gives Tanari a 10-second ultimatum, surrender or face the dire consequence of her and her friends losing their lives. Hayes is on the verge of causing harm to Tanari and the others when, out of nowhere, Imo emerges from behind and swiftly places a sword against Hayes's neck. He reveals that he woke up just minutes before he was taken away. He devised a cunning plan to deceive the guards by creating a hollow shell of himself. Imo is willing to sacrifice himself for Hayes's sake, on the condition that she releases his friends. Hayes agrees to the terms. Tanari, as the island chief, will need to depart from the island. 
she has the freedom to do so. She needs to select the individuals who will accompany her. Additionally, it is important to note that the ship has a capacity of only 700 individuals. Therefore, this serves as the upper limit for the number of people that Tanari can select. Tanari has made her decision and advocates for the liberation of all the children on the island. She then invites Nando and his brother to join them as well. Pyorin will also be joining them. Many people are upset with Tanari's decision, but she believes that the children deserve a better life than the one they currently have on the island. As they get ready to depart, Hayes incapacitates Tanari and her friends. She assures Imo that they will be transported across. She proceeds to administer another dose of tranquilizer to Imo. A few minutes later, Tanari regains consciousness, which comes as a surprise since she was expected to remain unconscious for several hours. She boards one of the lifeboats and begins making her way back to the island. She informs her boss and Nando to look after her friends and the children. Shortly thereafter, Tanari arrives at the location where Imo is being held captive. Just as she is about to discreetly slide a letter into the hole, Imo suddenly appears behind her. Imo managed to escape the hole by transforming into a mole rat. Imo is surprised that Tanari would choose to give up her only opportunity for freedom in order to return and rescue him. He expresses his gratitude to her for this, and they make the decision to depart together. Due to the storm, it is not possible for them to sail tonight. They must spend the night in a cave and then depart the next morning. Before going to sleep, they engage in conversation about various topics. Tanari ponders the possibility of Earth's destruction and questions whether this is the purpose for which his creator brought him into existence, to safeguard the knowledge of everything that existed prior to such an event. That night, Tanari had a dream in which she was reunited with her family members. The next morning, as they are preparing to depart, Imo's creator informs him that the Knockers have returned to the island. Tanari is reluctant to see Imo depart but understands that Imo feels compelled to stay due to his commitment to the people, despite their criminal backgrounds and the fact that a majority of them are deserving of severe consequences. Meanwhile, Hayes has also been informed that Imo has managed to escape. Additionally, she is informed about the report indicating that trouble is developing on the island. It has been discovered that the knockers have infested the corpse pit, resulting in the reanimation of hundreds of corpses resembling zombies. When Imo arrives, the islanders are already engaged in a battle against the zombies. At that moment, Tanari arrives to help him. Tanari's friends, including Yuroi, Mia, Upa, and others, quickly arrive to offer their assistance before he could fully comprehend the situation. As they begin to eliminate the zombies, Imo proposes the idea of relocating to the pit and annihilating all of them simultaneously. Upa falls, and as a result, the knockers infect her. The knockers influence Upa, who uses a spear to stab Mia in the belly. Tanari and Imo are experiencing a deeply distressing and sorrowful moment. They have recently lost two more friends due to their inability to protect them. Mia is still breathing, so Imo decides to transform into Gugu, and carefully carries her away from the area. They arrive at a location where the knockers will not infest. Within the next three minutes, Mia lies down. But unfortunately, there is nothing that can be done to save her, and she eventually passes away. Soon after, the knockers overran the area, but Tanari successfully managed to escape. Yuroi offers to stay behind and restrain them. Yuroi instructs Imo to transform into a mole with the intention of throwing him so that Ligard can catch him. He throws Imo into the air, and then Ligard swiftly carries him away from the area. The knockers have infected everyone in the area, including Yuroi. As life departs from Yuroi's body, he embraces a sense of contentment, harboring no regrets. He firmly holds on to the belief that the afterlife will bestow upon him a fulfilling existence. The battle against the zombies rages on, and during one intense moment, a knocker's core attempts to infest Hayes's body. However, she skillfully repels it without much effort. Hayes spots Tanari sprinting in the distance and swiftly retrieves a unique arrowhead, intending to eliminate her. Just as she is about to release the arrow, Imo appears in the form of Onaguma and prevents her from firing. Imo had the opportunity to kill her, but he chose to spare her life due to his strong resolve against taking another person's life. Imo transforms into Gugu and employs fire to eliminate all the zombies in order to rescue Tanari. Imo has successfully defeated all the knockers, leaving only three remaining, the knockers inside Mia, Yuroi, and Appa. Imo is experiencing reluctance when it comes to killing them. Suddenly, Hayes appears and takes Tanari hostage. In an instant, she issues a threat to toss Tanari into the fire unless Imo complies with her demands. Tanari, determined to prevent Imo from making a choice, makes the difficult decision to pull herself and Hayes into the fire. Imo successfully rescues the duo from falling into the fire. 
he quickly sedates Hayes before she has the chance to do anything else. Now, it's time to take care of Appa, Mia, and Yuroi. After successfully eliminating the intruders, Mia's body and the others are prepared for burial. Certain island elders are astonished to discover that Tanari is still present. She informs them that she and her friends have returned to provide assistance to the people. This evokes tears from them. A group of children returns to rescue the undeserving criminals, igniting a sense of morality within themselves. Tanari, the chief of the island, announces that arena fights have been abolished with immediate effect. Imo begins preparing to leave because he fears that if he stays, the knockers will launch another attack on the island. Tanari has made the decision to stay on the island and work towards its restoration. She is determined to witness the island's prosperity. After a short while, Imo embarks on a journey and departs from the island. Tanari instructs Ligard to accompany Imo and serve as his guide. Ligard will also assist Tanari in finding Imo when the time is right. Hayes is still under sedation, so Imo decides to take her with him. He has restrained her, rendering her unable to take any action. Hayes wakes up once they reach the middle of the ocean. She then confesses that she has been in love with Imo since the day they first met. She killed everyone who was close to him because she didn't want them to take Imo away from her. Imo feels disgusted upon hearing this. He finds it hard to believe that Hayes did all of this out of love. He creates another boat and instructs Hayes to find a way to free herself. Imo leaves her behind and continues sailing away. Suddenly, one of the cores from the knocker materializes and launches an attack on Hayes while she is inside the boat. Imo arrives at the port where Pyorin had mentioned she would be waiting. He spots Pyorin dining at a nearby restaurant. He decides not to disturb her and quietly departs. The next day, in the evening, he goes to her room and leaves a selection of fruits for her. The next morning, Imo is preparing to leave when he suddenly realizes that he forgot to leave a letter for her. He quickly returns, takes out a pen and paper, and composes a letter. Finally, he carefully places the letter where she can easily find it. As he is about to leave once more, he suddenly recalls that Pyorin might require a coat due to the chilly weather. He quickly returns to give Pyorin a coat, but he is unable to locate her in her room. He follows her scent and finds her hiding behind a nearby bush. There is an individual attempting to kidnap Pyorin, just as Emma is about to intervene. Pyorin single-handedly takes care of the bad guy. He continues to watch Pyorin because he finds it difficult to leave her. The creator informs him that Pyorin is quite elderly and could pass away at any moment. Imo becomes angry when his creator informs him that Pyorin will eventually pass away. Later that night, Imo quietly places a coat next to Pyorin while she is sleeping. Just as he is about to leave, Pyorin grabs him. Pyorin and Imo are both very happy to see each other. They travel to the Sarlnine forest together. Whenever Imo and Pyorin become aware of the presence of the knockers, they promptly choose to flee in the opposite direction. Over time, Pyorin's strength gradually diminishes until one day she collapses. Imo begins to take care of her and carries her wherever she wants to go. One day, Pyorin asks Imo for help retrieving something at the beach. While he is away, Pyorin visits the creator of Imo. She is aware that he is constantly observing them. She pleads with him, asking to be taken away and given the chance to be reborn as something useful for Imo. The maker of Imo accepts the deal and ends her life. He seizes her soul just before it becomes entangled in paradise. In her dream state, Pyorin envisions herself as a stunning young woman. The creator of Imo's maker produces an orb and instructs her to touch it. Afterward, she disappears into the sphere. However, when Imo returns to the shed, he discovers that Pyorin has passed away. He is overwhelmed with heartbreak and begins to cry uncontrollably. After some time, he musters up the courage to bury Pyorin. He continues on his never-ending journey. Many decades have passed, and Imo, now a grown man, continues to battle with the knocker. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.